Hello and welcome to lecture nine, where we'll be talking about digitization. So in the previous few lectures, lectures one to seven, we've spoken about modulation, we've introduced modulation, we've spoken about the types of analog modulation, including amplitude modulation and the different variants of amplitude modulation and angle modulation and the different variants of those. For each of these, we spoke about modulation, demodulation, we spoke about power, we spoke about bandwidth, we spoke about applications, we spoke about advantages and disadvantages. Now, before we start talking about digital modulation, we need to introduce the idea of digitization. Now, digital isn't new to you, and neither is the idea of digitization. But we're going to extend this slightly. So you will have seen sampling before in modules such as ILEC 270, Signals and Systems, and ILEC 207 instrumentation and control. And you'll also have seen ADC, or analog to digital conversion. We're going to talk about something called quantization. Because together, sampling and quantization result in something called digitization. So sampling on its own doesn't give you a digital signal if the signal is originally analog. But sampling and quantization does. Now once we've got digitization out of the way, then we can talk about digital modulation, whether it's band pass or baseband modulation. So that's lectures 10, 11, and 12 multiplexing. So this is a familiar topic to you. It's a slightly longer than normal lecture, but much of it will be familiar. So we are now at this bridging point here. Okay and we're working towards our next class test. So, we're going to reintroduce the Nyquist-Shannon criterion for um, reversible sampling. We'll talk about over and under sampling and anti-aliasing, or aliasing and anti-aliasing, and the types of filters and how to use them, and we'll spend some time talking about quantization and uh, some relevant um, uh, formulas related to that. So, you've seen this before. There's a lot of um, interest in everything digital uh, these days because of several of the advantages that digital offer, or offers over analog, um, not least of which the ability to correct errors, to encrypt, to compress, to store digitally, and to transmit digitally over uh, digital networks. So much of what we take for granted today in terms of um, communication is only possible because of digitization. And the first step in getting an analog signal into digital form is sampling. So sampling is what we do to convert a continuous time signal into discrete time. Okay, so this is terminology you should be familiar with from signals and systems. So sampling isn't um, necessarily, um, it doesn't give you a digital signal. If it starts with an analog signal, it ends with an analog signal. And it's possible because we have um, redundancy. And provided we abide by the Nyquist criterion, we are able to reconstruct our original signal from our discrete samples. So this is while it's still analog. 
this is not new to you. Well, so again, this isn't new, new to you either. The idea that we can model sampling as some kind of a switch that gives you a discrete time signal from a continuous time signal. Let's not dwell on that because we won't be dealing with that. We've spoken before about under and over sampling and we've said that both of them can be problematic except oversampling is less problematic than undersampling. And we've spoken about how um, undersampling results in something called aliasing. And aliasing is where the number of samples is inadequate, so you end up unable to determine exactly what your original signal was. So in the time domain, it looks like that, and in the frequency domain, we have something called spectral folding, where adjacent spectra overlap. So the sampling theorem specifies that if you have a band-limited signal, that means a signal that has no spectral components above some frequency b, then your sampling frequency has to be at least twice b. Another way of saying that is that the time between your samples, because the samples will be regularly spaced, the time between your samples must be at least, or at most, 1 over tb. So that's your sampling period. So Ts must be at most 1 over 2b. Or F, so Fs is 1 over Ts. So the sampling rate must be at least twice the highest frequency con component within the signal. Again, this shouldn't be new to you. So for example, if we have an audio message containing signals of up to 1 kilohertz, and 3 kilohertz, so you've got two components. You've got a component at 1 kilohertz and a component at 3 kilohertz. The question is, what is a suitable sampling rate? So first of all, let's find the maximum frequency component. So B is the larger of the two. It's, it's the maximum of 1 kilohertz and 3 kilohertz. So B will be 3 kilohertz. Now your sample rate or your Nyquist rate is 2b. So that's 6 kilohertz. So your sample rate needs to be greater than 2b. So it needs to be greater than 6 kilohertz. So a suitable sample rate might be 8 kilohertz. 2 kilohertz is not suitable, 4 kilohertz is not suitable, 6 kilohertz is not suitable. So 6 kilohertz is what we consider critical sampling. And because you have a component at 3 kilohertz, then critical sampling is definitely not acceptable. So let me write that. It's called critical sampling. So you'd need something greater than 6. 8 kilohertz is fine, 10 kilohertz is fine, 20 kilohertz is fine. Now, strictly speaking, 100 kilohertz is also fine in the sense that you can recover your signal using um, uh, a low-pass filter if you were to sample at 100 kilohertz. But it's, um, it's not what we'd call suitable, okay, because it's oversampling. It's um, highly oversampled. Okay, so 8 kilohertz works, 100 kilohertz works, but a suitable sampling rate you would be looking at something in the order of 8, 10, 12, 15, not 100. So once you get into this territory you're um, you're creating a, an extreme redundancy or a wastage in terms of bandwidth if you're transmitting it or in terms of storage if you're storing it.
Another question. Say you have an audio signal that contains signals from 300 to 3,300 kilohertz. Okay, so you've got your um, audio between 300 and 300, 3,300 kilohertz. So let's just fix that. And the question is, what's the Nyquist sampling rate? So the Nyquist sampling rate, we're not asking for a suitable sampling rate, we're asking for the Nyquist sampling rate. So the Nyquist rate is twice B. And B is the highest frequency. So it's the maximum of 300 and 3,300, which is 3,300. So the Nyquist rate would be twice that. That's your Nyquist rate. So a sample rate, a suitable sampling rate, if that were the question, a sampling rate would have to be greater than 6600. So a sample rate in the order of 10 kilohertz would be acceptable. 15 kilohertz, 20 kilohertz, 30 kilohertz, that would be perfectly acceptable. But the question here is only asking for the Nyquist rate. So the Nyquist rate is that. So it was well, twice that, so that's your Nyquist rate. Okay, so this idea that as you sample in the time domain, the same thing happens in the frequency domain. We're still sampling, but the effect is that your original spectrum gets replicated, and you have these replicas, and this repeats. And really, I should have used F here rather than omega. And the higher the sample rate, the greater the, um, the guard band we have here between adjacent spectra. So here we have the three conditions, critical sampling, oversampling, and undersampling. So critical sampling is when your sample rate is equal to the Nyquist rate. So you're sampling at exactly 2b. So your spectra, your adjacent spectra, don't overlap, but there's no guard band. They basically touch. So this can be acceptable if you have very low or zero or um, close to zero power at this um, uh, frequency B. But generally, we try to avoid critical sampling. And if you have a frequency component that's non-zero at um, B hertz, then that's definitely not acceptable. Okay, so critical sampling, in almost all cases, you'll want to avoid. Now, if oversampling is when your sample rate is greater than the Nyquist rate. So that gives you this so-called guard band between adjacent spectra. And that's really useful. It means that when you want to recover your message, you can use a low-pass filter. And that low-pass filter doesn't have to be a brick wall ideal filter. It can have a, a roll-off that's slightly more realistic, more... Um, low cost and more achievable and it can do that using the guard band without picking up anything from the adjacent spectrum. Now if your sample rate is less than the Nyquist rate then you're going to get this spectral folding and that's not good because if you then try to recover your signal even if you use a brick wall filter an ideal low pass filter you would still have a distortion. And that distortion is what we refer to as aliasing. 
So how do we recover our message? How do we, um, this is the spectrum of our original message. This is the spectrum of our sampled message. In this case, it's oversampled. What can we do to recover the original message? Well, um, we apply a low pass filter. In this case, it's an ideal low pass filter because it allows this um, part of the spectrum to pass and it'll block all the higher frequency components. So you'll recover your original message. Okay, so it's a low pass filter that we use to recover the original signal. So, a question. Can an oversampled signal be perfectly reconstructed? Oversampled, so Fs is greater than 2b. Can it be perfectly reconstructed? That means, can we go from our signal to oversampled signal? So that's discrete. Can we go back to the original signal? such that this is exactly the same as that, with no error. Is it possible to do that? Yes or no? Well, according to Nyquist, provided we stick to the uh, criteria, provided these samples are greater than twice the highest frequency component within the message, then the answer is yes, it is possible to perfectly reconstruct our original signal after sampling. Of course, what we would need is an ideal low-pass filter um, at the recovery end. But the question is, can it be recovered? We're not asking for the conditions, but the conditions are that we need to sample at greater than twice the bandwidth of the original message, and we need an ideal low-pass filter at the um, receiving end. So, if we can't oversample, if we end up critically sampling or um, undersampling, or if, if, we, if we were to undersample, then we will need to somehow mitigate the effect of the distortion or the aliasing. So we use something called an anti-aliasing filter. An anti-aliasing filter is a low-pass filter. And we can either do this before or after sampling. In both cases, we're going to remove some of the effects of aliasing. We can't remove all the effects of aliasing, but we can remove some of the effects. Pre-filtering removes part of the signal to avoid aliasing happening in the first place, whereas post-filtering removes the part of the signal that's been affected by the aliasing. So the question is, is it better to apply this filter before or after the sampling process? Should we apply the aliasing, anti-aliasing filter before or after the sampling process. Now this was an exam question in, I think, 2019. And again in um, 2020. In 2020, I asked um, for this to be quantified um, using expressions. And here, I asked for it to be quantified using numbers. So, It's not enough to know whether we want to sample before or after. We want to be able to quantify how much of the signal's bandwidth is lost and how much is retained by applying the anti-aliasing filter before 
or after the sampling process. Okay, so this is something um, that's come up in previous uh, final exams and uh, it's perfectly reasonable to expect this to come up again. So um, I suggest you have a look at this. The answer, of course, is before. So if you had a signal with some spectrum like this, I've, I've gone through this in another pencast on the problem, um, in the problem sheet uh, area, but if you were to undersample, you would have something like this. So here you have bandwidth there, here you have fs minus b. This bit is what's affected by your aliasing or your spectral folding. Now if we were to apply our low pass filter before that happened, we could have just filtered the signal at this frequency here and that would just avoid having aliasing in the first place. We'd end up with critical sampling. Whereas if we were to sample after, so if we were to filter after the sampling, then you would have to filter here, and you'd retain this and block all of this. So effectively, you would lose all of this bandwidth. Whereas with pre-filtering, you would only lose this much bandwidth. So there's a significant difference. So pre-filtering or filtering before sampling is better. So the question is, is it better to apply before or after? The answer is before. So that was the first part of the lecture, the, the bit you're all familiar with. That's sampling. That's how to get from continuous to digital. So continuous to discrete. But we still don't have a digital signal. To get a digital signal, we still need digitization. So we still need ADC to happen, analog to digital conversion. And that we refer to as quantization. So here your blue signal is an analog signal. The red signal is a um, quantized signal. And if you notice here, you have a fixed finite number of voltage levels. That's what makes a signal digital. So what we want, so whenever I draw a signal like this, what you should imagine is a uh, discrete signal that looks like this. So just for visualization purposes, we're drawing these as um, continuous time, but in reality, they have to be discrete time signals. <clears throat> so never mind this slide right now. This is in, in a way, this is just to prepare you for the next lecture where we'll be talking about modulation or pulse modulation. So you have your analog signal that needs to be sampled and then quantized, then encoded into bits prior to modulation. Okay, but for the purpose of today's lecture, don't worry about this. So this isn't yet directly relevant, but you will be looking at this information in a few minutes. Okay, so you, you'll see this slide again next week. So what is quantization? It's mapping a discrete time continuous value. Let's just look at those two words first. Continuous time, sorry, discrete time, continuous va uh, value. So discrete time simply means something that consists of discrete samples. Discrete samples. Continuous valued just means that these values have still not been quantized. They haven't been digitized. They can still have an infinite number of possible values. So quantization is mapping this discrete time continuous valued signal 
onto a limited or a finite number of discrete valued signals. So we're mapping from X of n to Y of n. So we have things called decision levels and representation levels. And what that gives us, it gives us some... So again, I'm, I'm drawing a continuous time signal. If you think of it simply as these discrete time signals. So these discrete time signals, if you notice, they have a finite number of amplitudes. So it looks like there are only one, two, three, four levels. Four levels means two bits. So we're talking about a two-bit quantizer here. And if you subtract, if you were to subtract, even if we look at this as continuous time rather than discrete time, if you were to subtract your um, original signal from the quantized signal, this is your error. Okay, so this error we sometimes refer to as noise or quantization noise. Now, to express things mathematically, if we're using n bits, then the number of levels is related to the number of bits exponentially. So L is 2 to the power n. So for one bit, you can have two levels. For two bits, four levels. Three bits, eight levels, etc. Okay, so if you know the number of if you know the number of bits, you can find the number of levels. And if you know the number of levels, you can find the number of bits. So for example, if you had um, um, 64 levels, then n would be log two of 64. Okay, so these two go together. We also have our quantization step size. So if you think of this as your signal, and if that's your the range of your signal, let's say that's um, v peak to peak, and we quantize that into a finite number of levels, then each of these levels will have um, oops, each of these will have a size of delta where delta is R over L, and R is often peak, V peak to peak. Now, why do I say often and not always? Because V peak to peak relates to your signal, whereas R relates to your quantizer. And if you've matched your signal to your quantizer, then that's when you're allowed to say R is equal to V peak to peak. Now, your quantization error is related to this step size, isn't it? So your quantization error is half this step size. So your quantization error is that much. So it's always going to be plus or minus delta over 2. That's your quantization error. And because what we're actually doing is we're taking an analog signal and we're producing digital values, we're actually generating bits or a bit stream. And if you're generating fs samples per second and n bits per sample, so let me write that out. So fs um, samples per second and n bits uh, per sample, that will give you a bit rate which is the number of bits 
per second. So bits per second equals bits per sample multiplied by samples per second. So when we talk about quantization, quantization is an imperfect process and it results in errors or noise. And there are two types of noise. There's the overload noise and granularity noise. So granularity noise, that's what we were talking about. That's the delta over two we were talking about. And overload noise is when your dynamic range isn't matched well enough. So for example, if you have a quantizer range R and your signal is matched to that range, then everything is fine. But if your signal is not matched to that range, then what's going to happen? You're going to lose signal amplitudes which are above or below or outside the range of the quantizer. So effectively, anything above or below the range of the quantizer will be quantized to the maximum or minimum. So that results in a type of noise that we call overload noise, and it's difficult, different from the granularity noise, which is related to um, the resolution of the quantizer. And we often need to trade these two um, off, and we'll look at some ways in which um, we can do that. So just more formally, when we talk about dynamic range, it's the ratio of the largest amplitude of a sinusoid that avoids clipping. Clipping is what we were describing here. To the largest amplitude of a sinusoid whose variation goes undetected, i.e. the quantization error. Okay, so strictly speaking, what we should be um, dividing its V peak rather than V peak to peak divided by delta over 2. And because V peak to peak is twice VP, delta is twi twice delta over 2, so we can use that shorthand. So, a question for you. We've already asked, can an oversampled signal be perfectly reconstructed? The question today is, can a quantized signal be perfectly reconstructed? So if a signal has been quantized, quantized means it's been digitized. Okay, is it possible to reconstruct the original analog signal from the digital samples? And the answer is no, it's not possible. There is always going to be some degree of loss. Okay, there's always going to be either granularity noise or overload noise or both. So let's just talk about the effect of this. So remember we said that L equals 2 to the power N, so the number of levels. So here we have 4 bit, so we have L equals 2 to the power 4, 16 levels. 3 bit, L equals 8, and 2 bit, L equals 4. So you can see, with only four levels, you see how our original signal, the approximation doesn't look very good at all. But with 16 levels, the approximation is much better. So simply changing the number of bits will affect how good your approximation is how much of an error there is. So if you look at each of these um, samples, you look at the, the difference there is, that gives you an idea of the quantization noise. There are 
a couple of um, quick um, YouTube videos I wanted to share with you. This first one shows the difference between um, 8-bit versus 24-bit audio. And before I play the clip, what do you think the difference between 8-bit and 24-bit audio will be? Again, when we speak about 8-bit, we're talking about the number of levels. Okay, so 8-bit audio, we're talking about 2 to the power 8 levels. And 24-bit is 2 to the power 24 levels. So you can imagine that the quality is going to be much higher for the 24-bit levels. What does quality mean when we talk about audio? So if it's music, what does low-quality music even sound like? How will it represent, uh, manifest? There's going to be quantization noise. We're going to be hearing this bit, all of this, this quantization noise. You will be hearing that. What do you think it'll sound like? Sound speeds, whether your sample rate is 44.1 kilohertz or 48 kilohertz. But why do we have two? I mean, why don't we just have one standard digital sample rate? Well, let's discuss this. By the late 1970s, PCM, or pulse code modulation format digital audio, was being recorded on pneumatic three-quarter inch analog videotape. Early on, it was determined that in order to record and reproduce sound of a certain frequency, you had to have a sample rate of twice that. Human hearing is approximately 20 to 20,000 hertz, and to reproduce that full range of frequency, you have to have a sample frequency of at least 40k. Here's why. One entire sound wave consists of a crest and a trough, a positive frequency sample and a negative frequency sample. Sample 1, sample 2. Two samples per audible frequency, therefore 20,000 Hz requires a 40K sampling frequency at the bare minimum. For the math that proves this, look up the Nyquist-Shannon theorem, link down in the description. Leading manufacturers at the time wanted to create a standard digital sample frequency, and then decided on 44.1K, but why? They determined that they needed a data rate of around 1.4 megabits per second for lossless 16-bit audio. Remember when I said they were recording on pneumatic videotape? Well, pre-HD video in the US was 525 lines of resolution, and 35 of those lines were non-video lines dedicated to things like closed captioning and timecode. That leaves 490 lines, and at 29.97 frames per second, they could put three samples on each line of resolution and get a 44,055.9 sample frequency. In PAL, they had 625 lines of resolution with 588 available lines of resolution and a 25 frames per second frame rate. If they do the same three samples per line, you get exactly 44,100. So 44.1 is close enough to work for both PAL and NTSC. You may say, close enough is good enough? Yeah, it is. If you can show me a better, easy to use sample rate that's compatible with existing 44.1 kilohertz and common 24, 25, 23.976, and 29.97 frame rates, then I will help you get your sample rate to the right engineers. One last note, 44.1K gives additional frequencies over the human hearing frequency range, so a low-pass filter is applied at 20,000 Hz. In short, full audible frequencies here, and you don't need to pass any more sound here, so in the middle is something called a transition band, which basically fades out the sound between here and here to prevent aliasing. Aliasing is when the frequency is recorded outside of the range of frequencies being recorded, in this case frequencies above 44.1 kHz, are confused by the digital to analog converter as frequencies within the range of recorded frequencies, thereby adding incorrect data or sound to your recording. For more information on aliasing, link down in the description. So that's 44.1k kHz, but how do we get to 48k? When DAT, digital audio tape, was released by Sony back in 1987, the option to record at 48K 16-bit was included amongst the recording format options. 
The reason? It is an even number and fully compatible with all the common sampling frequencies like 8K, 16K, 32K, and 44.1K. Better yet, it's an easy multiplier of all but the oddball 44.1K. The big reason though, when recording sound for TV and motion pictures, it's fully compatible with all common picture recording frame rates, 24, 25, 23.976, and 29.97. So there you have it. In simplest possible terms, 44.1K was first and is all that's necessary for full human hearing frequency range digital audio recording, but 48K is easier to use when recording sound to accompany a picture format. Thanks for joining me in this episode of Sound Speeds and be sure to tune into the future for more sound knowledge and sound advice. Another question for you. If we have 1024 levels, how many bits do we need to represent that? So L equals 2 to the power n. So 1024 is 2 to the power n. How are you going to find n? Well, you either know it or you take a logarithm. So n equals log 1024. Very important, E log has to be to the base 2, otherwise you won't get the right answer. So if you take log to the base 10, you'll get the wrong answer. Okay. 10, 1024 bits is also the wrong answer. What you want is that, 10 bits. So you need 10 bits to achieve 1024 samples. Sorry, levels. Now this is an interesting question. How does doubling the number of levels affect the number of bits per sample? Number of bits per sample is n, the number of levels is l. So if l equals 2 to the power n, if I were to double this from 16 to 32, for example, if this were to double, if I were to have double the number of levels, what would that do to number of bits. Would it also double the number of bits or half the number of bits? So just think of it like this. If, if we have 2L, that'll give you 2 times 2 to the power n, which is 2 to the power n plus 1. So effectively, you will have one extra bit for every sample. So adding one bit doubles the number of levels. That's a really important conclusion. So we've spoken about changing the number of levels. We've spoken about changing the number of bits to change the number of levels. We haven't spoken about changing the sample rate. Now, we spoke about sample rate in the context of Nyquist and uh, oversampling and undersampling. But let's assume that we are now oversampling. Is it possible to improve the quality of our signal by oversampling? Now, in the first semester, we said it wasn't possible. We said if you oversample by a factor of 2 or 4 or 5 or 10 or 100, it won't affect the quality of your recovered signal because you'll have a perfect reconstruction as long as you're oversampling. But that didn't take into account the effect of um, quantization. That was all analog. Once we start talking about digital signals or digitization, we have to take into, effect, into account the effect of quantization noise. And this is where oversampling actually becomes... Um, are valuable. So if you notice this first um, uh, signal and the second and the third, what is it that's changing? The sample rate has changed. And if you notice here you have your sine wave and you have your approximation. This is the digital approximation after quantization. Now, even if we have the same number of bits, that's the same number of n, therefore the same number of levels, your approximation here is not as good. 
Why? Because we have fewer samples. We're still oversampling. This is still oversampling. But because we ha we're, we're not sampling at the same rate, we've reduced the sample rate, the quality of our recovered, um, or the quality of our approximation is much less. And look at this. This is our original signal. We have one, two, three, four samples in that one uh, period. So we're still oversampling because four is greater than two. But look at this. That doesn't look anything like our original signal. So if you see this first one, it's close enough. You can recognize it's a sine wave. Here you can't even recognize it's a sine wave. So that's good, and that's not so good, even though we have oversampling, oversampling, oversampling. So oversampling does improve the quality of your recovered signal if you're digitizing. So this is a question for you to consider. There are two things you can do. You can increase the sample rate or you can increase the resolution. And by resolution, we're talking about increasing L or increasing N. Increasing the sample rate is increasing this. So in reality, in real life, you would want to improve, increase both. You would want to oversample and have loads of levels. In practice, you would have to, to trade these off. You would have to choose something that's within the limitations of your software, your hardware, and your communication system. Or what you could do is additionally do something called non-uniform quantization. That means that your quantizer wouldn't have regularly spaced levels. And we do that because the kind of signals we often deal with don't have uniform probability density functions. That means, for example, in audio signals in speech, loud signals are less probable than um, lower amplitude signals, and the ear is less sensitive to high amplitudes. We're more sensitive to lower amplitudes. So therefore, it makes sense to use more bits, a greater number of levels, for smaller amplitudes than for higher amplitudes. And that's where non-uniform quantization comes in. So rather than have a uniform distribution of levels, where for high amplitudes and for low amplitudes, we distribute the number of levels equally if a uniform quantization. What we could do, so here we have n equals 3 and l equals 8. That's 2 to the power 3. And here we have the same, l equals 8 and n equals 3. But because we have more levels assigned to the lower amplitudes and fewer levels assigned to the higher amplitudes, our approximation is much better for this low amplitude sine wave compared to this approximation, which doesn't even look like a sine wave. So non-uniform quantization beats uniform quantization for low amplitude sine waves. Let's look at high amplitude sine waves. So let's look at the high amplitude. So this there sort of looks like a sine wave, but then so does this. And this has used only three levels, whereas here it's used four or five, actually. So non-uniform quantization helps when we have 
lower amplitude signals. So to achieve non-uniform quantization, what we often end up doing is using a uniform quantizer, but then applying a non-linearity before and after the non-uniform, the uniform quantizer, where the second non-linearity is the inverse of the second. Sorry, the second non-linearity is the inverse of the first. So we call this compounding because we're compressing using this nonlinearity and we're expanding using this nonlinearity. So what this effectively does is it reduces the dynamic range of the audio before compression. And it, it has the effect of reducing noise. So things like buzz, hiss, and low-level audio tones. We can reduce this because we're making better use of the dynamic range of your quantizer by compressing before applying a uniform quantizer. So even though we have a uniform quantizer, we refer to this process as nonlinear quantization. Does anyone know what noise reduction is? No, who no. Tell us, Mr. Audio. A problem with analog tape arose when trying to record material that had a larger dynamic range than the tape did. So engineers turned to noise reduction. Noise reduction systems work by companding the signal, meaning that the signal was dynamically compressed during recording so that it would fit within the signal-to-noise ratio of the tape. On playback, the signal would be expanded to restore its original dynamic range. There were two popular analog noise reduction systems, DBX and Dolby. DBX was founded by David Blackmer, who formerly worked for a company that made medical testing equipment. That company also had a signal-to-noise issue in that when sticking medical probes inside a human body, the voltages had to be very low so as not to kill the patient. Blackmer's company had developed a compounding system so that the measuring voltages could be low, but the data could still be usable. He saw that this technology could be adapted for audio, and started his own company to do just that. Ray Dolby of Dolby Labs had developed both Dolby A and later Dolby SR noise reduction. Dolby also created and licensed both Dolby B and C noise reduction for cassettes. Today, noise reduction isn't necessary with digital gear, but for those analog tapes, it made a big difference. Thanks, Mr. Audio. So now our signal has been digitized. That means it's been sampled and it's been quantized. We then encode it into bits. So what you now have is a bit stream. Just a series of bits. So now you have your bit stream. Now we're ready for digital communications. That's what this module or this half of the module is about, digital communications. How are we going to transmit? How are we going to transmit these ones and zeros? Well, we can either do it baseband or band pass. So that means we're either going to do it wirelessly or we'll use some kind of physical medium. All right, so if we're going to use a fiber optic cable or copper cables or coaxial cables, whatever cables we use, that's called baseband communication. We use pulse modulation for that, and that's lecture 10, our next lecture. The lecture after that, lecture 11, will be looking at wireless communication. So whether it's satellite communication, radio communication, mobile communication, all of these use a carrier signal. So this is wireless communication or band pass communication. That we'll look at in lecture 11. So that was today's lecture where we looked at digitization and we introduced the idea of quantization and we added that to
what we already know about sampling. We introduced the idea of anti-aliasing filters pre and post. We spoke about non-linear quantization. We introduced the idea of compounding. We spoke about um, dynamic range. We spoke about quantization error. And we are now ready to launch into the final few lectures of this module where we'll be looking at digital transmission. So here is a quick summary of the mathematical expressions we'll be looking at in our problem class. And our next lecture we'll be looking at baseband modulation or pulse modulation. So I hope you found that helpful. Until we meet again, stay home and stay safe.